Hello everyone, this is Eric, the Asian movie enthusiast, and this is my review of Shin Godzilla, also known as Godzilla Resurgence, a Japanese action drama horror hybrid from 2016. This is the first Godzilla film that I got to see in a cinema in my entire life, and I'm glad I got the opportunity. Where I live, this had one showtime in one theater on Saturday, so I was lucky to find it. So here's a plot synopsis for you. An unknown accident occurs in Tokyo Bay's Aqualine, which causes an emergency cabinet to assemble. All of a sudden, a giant creature immediately appears, destroying town after town with its landing reaching the capital. This mysterious giant monster is named Godzilla, of course. Now, first of all, the monster design of the big green guy is respectful mostly to prior Japanese efforts, but also has quite a few new, cool changes to it. He actually shows up in a hilarious uh, form early on that is quite ballsy by the filmmakers, I would say, but quite fun to watch as well. I was laughing my butt off when I first saw him. It was so much fun. Later on, he shows up in his more familiar form, I'll put it that way. So, counting both forms, Godzilla does get quite a bit of screen time in this film, even though he only has basically three big rampages throughout. The first rampage feels like it goes on forever because it's spliced in with a lot of the human responses, so the first big rampage feels like it lasts a while, which is a good thing. The destruction inflicted on the city is impressive, and actually portrayed in a horrific fashion, actually, which was surprising to me. And consequently, this is one of the few Godzilla films that dips its, it dips a bit into horror territory, so to speak. The counterattacks by the humans are, you know, a mix of predictable stuff, stuff you've seen before, but the battles themselves do contribute some visuals that we've never seen before in this franchise, so that's good. Shin Godzilla definitely de delivers on the action front. And this is very nicely shot as well. Uh, the director here is Hideaki Anno, who anime fans will certainly know. He also directed a very interesting live action film called Ritual from 2000, which is worth checking out if you haven't seen it. Anno does a very good job at choosing his camera angles and showing the scale of everything that is happening. There's a lot of good camera shots in this movie. Some shots are kind of at ground level, uh, while others are wide shots that are miles away from the action. So it's a nice mix, too. It doesn't get very static in its camera, uh, uh, I guess, camera work. Works very well. I was a little worried going into this because Shinji Higuchi co-directed this. Now, he was the guy who gave us the live-action Attack on Titan films. You know, the first of which I personally think was pretty good. The second, not so much. But I think it's obvious that Anno took the reins here because the dramatic content is more effective and engaging than those Attack on Titan films. Speaking of which, some reviewers have complained okay, about the heavy doses of dialogue in this movie. Which is understandable to a degree because, you know, it does feel a bit taxing at times, to be honest. But this is some of the most energetic editing turning dialogue that you'll ever see in a Godzilla movie. I mean, the characters talk fast and respond to one another at a blistering pace. I like this because it feels like there's not a lot of wasted time. Uh, another complaint that I've seen is that the titles for all the characters show up at the bottom of the screen while at the same time the subtitles of their dialogue are shown with those titles. Sometimes the titles show up at the top of the screen and the dialogue's at the bottom. So at times there's a bit too much to read on screen. I can see that complaint. Uh, I mean, there is a reason why they show the titles of the characters, which I will get to in a minute. In any case, <clears throat> if you go to see this movie, because it is still playing in some theaters, if the subtitles are bothering you early on, focus on the dialogue at the bottom of the screen. Don't worry so much about the titles of the characters at the top. Now, one thing that has been pointed out by some reviewers, but completely glossed over by others, is that there is a 
ton of political commentary in this movie that serves as the foundation for the entire film. The real life mishandling of the Fukushima nuclear meltdown should be kept in mind when you go into this, okay? Because the political and bureaucratic satire is just up front and presented immediately in this movie, right from the opening five minutes. Within the, within the first five minutes, this theme is introduced and it's explored significantly in conjunction with all of the procedural requirements and brainstorming that occurs between the protagonists. So the interesting thing is that all of these characters are portrayed as intelligent people, but are restricted by, you know, the red tape and procedural requirements that surround them, resulting in a lack of a proper response to this threat. And that's the reason for the use of all the ridiculous titles that we've seen in the subtitles, because it accentuates the absurd bureaucracy on display. I mean, some of the titles are paragraph length. You know, something like Administrator of Public Affairs, Monster Life Form Division, Executive Secretary to Chief Cabinet Deputy Secretary. It's like, it's, it's ridiculous, and it, it's purposeful because it adds to the satire. Now... That's not the only commentary that's in this movie. I have seen some, some people point out the, you know, the, the political commentary, the bureaucratic type stuff, the Fukushima type stuff. But there's another type of commentary at play here. Okay, this does have a slight nationalistic bent to it. What I mean by that is, you know, in real life, okay, after World War II, Japan was deprived of military action, okay, as part of the treaty with, its uni with the United States. So the 1947 Constitution basically renounced active military for Japan. There, there's a lot of, like, a lot of nuances re with regard to this relationship, but practically speaking, Japan has been limited to a self-defense force of a few hundred thousand people, I guess, nowadays. Now, the purpose of this force is to handle threats and natural disasters within the country. Okay, The United States is the military force meant to protect and assist Japan in case of war or threats from outside countries. So this basically means that Japan has been reliant on the United States in that regard for like 60 plus years. But in recent years, the Japanese government in real life has, you know, held discussions to implement a full-scale rearmament of the country, you know, citing the outdated treaty that was established over half a century ago, as well as some of the neighboring threats nowadays, like North Korea, as kind of justification for rearmament. So that's a kind of a big-time issue in Japan nowadays. And Shin Godzilla, this movie, basically asks this question, okay, especially during the later half of the film. You know, does, does Japan always need the United States to solve their biggest problems? You know, isn't this relationship an intrinsic, an intrinsic threat to the country's sovereignty? You know what I mean? So this Godzilla movie is actually very topical and relevant in terms of contemporary Japanese issues. You gotta give it credit for that. I mean, it's something to be admired, I think. Now, in terms of the characters, there's a lot of characters in this. It's effectively impossible to develop all of them, and there's dozens of characters in this. But there is some character development for a few of the main characters that's mostly saved during the latter half of the film. Because the main character in this film kind of emerges as the film moves along. And I like the character, actually, to be honest. There are also close to a dozen legitimately funny moments during this film, which helps to give the protagonist a little bit of color. You know, it's not just all a bunch of, like, boring conversations and conference rooms. There's some pretty funny moments that happen in this, and I like that. Also, if you're a fan of Japanese film, there's quite a few recognizable actors here as well, which I'll let you uh, find out for yourself. But I will give one little, uh, one little tidbit. Director Shinya Sukamoto actually has a small supporting acting role in this, which I thought was pretty cool. I like seeing him uh, act every once in a while, so he was good. So Shin Godzilla was an enjoyable movie, quite an enjoyable movie, I think. I'm really glad I got to see it in the cinema. You, got, you get a sense of the scope. And there's almost a 100% chance that it will be widely available on DVD and Blu-ray at some point in the United States 
and other, other countries internationally, just due to the popularity of the franchise. So definitely check this one out. It's a little bit different. You know, some people say all the all the Godzilla films without other monsters are the same, you know, the ones that just have Godzilla in them. This one has some similarities, but it carves itself out. This is a memorable film. I recommend it. So as always, see you next time.